Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. We hope you enjoy this evening's edition. Hi, I'm Tim Byrne, and this is Labor Vision. So we continue our series on the Rhode Island Bill and Trades Council uh, and, and how they've grown uh, their political agendas uh, and how we move projects and, and some of the projects that have been going through the state. It's no secret that Rhode Island is beginning to come on the move. We see cranes in the sky in the city of Providence, and we're seeing a, a lot of activity around the state and a lot of proposed activity. Uh, we've got uh, Mike Sabatoni, President of Rhode Island Bill and Trades Council, and Scott Duhamel, the Secretary Treasurer of Rhode Island Bill and Trades Council, with us today. And what we want to talk about is, uh, is exactly what we see in Providence, guys. We see cranes in the sky. Mm -hmm. It's been a long time since we've done any sizable building in, in the city of Providence. Mm -hmm. uh, we see the School of Nursing, uh, Wexford, the new Wexford Biomedical Project. Uh, the multiple hotel, hotels going down uh, in, in the city of uh, Providence. And, and URI is, is, is entering a, a, a growth period. Brown University, Providence College, these are, these are all uh, construction projects and programs that started someplace and went. But as we know, when we build these things, we need people to build them. Mm -hmm. And, and since, since the demise in 2008, uh, a lot of our, our affiliates have lost membership. Uh, so I guess we're into a recruiting stage. So my question would start off, if I want to start with you, Mike, is that how do you see the, uh, uh, the, the amount of people that we have to build these and, and the recruiting for the future? Where do, where do we get the, the people for our, for our union so we can build these projects? Well, thanks for having me, Tim. Um, yeah, it's a good problem to have. Uh, we haven't had this problem in quite some time. We are definitely in growth mode. Uh, we've lost uh, members since the Great Recession of 2008 uh, due to either people just leaving our industry because of lack of employment opportunities uh, as well as just uh, uh, people retiring. We have an aging population within the building trades. The good news is, is that because of our uh, investments in our training infrastructure, our training programs, our registered apprenticeship programs, we have the ability to uh, continue to uh, feed uh, our industry with the young men and women that it needs uh, you know, in a timely fashion. So it's a good problem to have. Uh, there's a lot of recruitment activities going on throughout the 16 uh, organizations in the building trades. Uh, and um, you know, there's, uh, there's definitely a labor demand, not only in the construction industry, but in all industries uh, as a whole right now. So it's gotten a lot more sophisticated on how we interview, attract, uh, stimulate uh, interests in our industry. We're talking uh, now of uh, going into the career and technical uh, academies in and around the state of Rhode Island, uh, both public and private, uh, so that we can create a pipeline of young men and women that want an opportunity via registered apprenticeship programs, via our, our modern uh, state-of-the-art training uh, infrastructure uh, abilities that we have. So uh, we are poised to meet that demand. It still will have some difficulties, but uh, you know, the fact that we have that in place sets us apart from, uh, from our merit counterparts. So training is a big part of, of, of the co construction trades. I mean, obviously it's dangerous work. And you need to be skilled, and you need to be skilled in, in your craft as well as in safety. Uh, but uh, we still can't get past the idea that we hear all the time. Construction is just temporary jobs. Mm -hmm, right. Now, temporary jobs would give the, the implication that anybody can do that. Mm -hmm. Scott, are they temporary jobs? Well, the byword is uh, a union construction worker's career is made up of a series of temporary jobs. We go, we build it, and we're gone. Back to the bench, maybe back to another job. So that's always been, we found that highly insultive and really a, a, a short-term way to describe what we do. We don't go, there's no building that lasts 30 years. You know, well, I wish there was. Um, maybe I'd still be there. The other thing is, it, in the long run, we, we got to keep, we, you know, a lot of what we do politically, which we talked about before, we have to generate these projects and fight for these projects. And it's often a fight. We have to fight with and for developers. We have to continually find new projects to replace the old. 
Just last week, we were happy to hear of a project that we fought for many years ago, the five winter, offshore wind turbines we did outside of Block Island. It announced that we're gonna probably do 50 of them. And it will look at this point, as we did before, they'll be built by union hands. Right. And we'll, once again, which since we're talking about recruitment, we'll be looking for people to fill those spots. You know, just let me comment on that temporary job thing because that's, that's very frustrating to me as president of the Rhode Island Building Trades uh, when that stigma is attached to the service that we provide as construction trade men and women in the state. Every service is temporary. If a lawyer tries a case, that case is temporary. Does he, does he quit after, he, uh, after the case is done? No, he goes on to the next one. Or a doctor performs a procedure. Well, that procedure is temporary. Does he quit after he performs his first procedure or does he continue on? It's a service that's provided. Construction is no different. We provide a service. We build something and then we go on and build something else. So, you know, it really uh, irks me when people give us the stigma or, or, or stigmatize uh, what we do as temporary. Uh, you know, we provide a, a valuable service. We build things. And when we're done, we move on and build something else. So uh, it's, you know, it's something that, uh, uh, you know, the detractors of what we're always trying to promote will, will, will try to attach to something if they're not in favor of it, that the jobs created will only be temporary. No, we provide a service. We'll build something, and when it's complete, we'll move on, mm -hmm. and we'll build something else. And to get those skills takes an awful lot of training, uh, and ability to be able to, you know, build some pretty sophisticated things. If you look around, what we'll go, either goes into a building or a wastewater treatment plant or a power plant or wind turbines or tunnels or bridges, uh, you know, keep the, uh, what you, the, you know, the, the water flowing. It's a lot of work and it's very technical work. So it's, uh, it's and it can be very rewarding as well. Another, another buzzword that's a pet peeve is workforce development. And that's, you know, all over the country, each state says, oh, we need workforce development, workforce development, which is true in some aspects, but not in our industry. We've been doing workforce development for 100 straight years, 100 plus years with our apprenticeship programs. We've developed the workforce. We continue to do it. We do it at the highest manner possible. And we do it with outtaking public monies. We do it because in our collective bargaining, management and labor has decided to pay for training. So it always bothers me, this workforce development phrase. And I say, haven't you looked at the construction unions? Do you know what apprenticeship is? You know, it's kind of a, a long period of success, continued success. You know, let's, let's stay on the training end of this. Um, <clears throat> you said something about uh, uh, the wind turbines. Uh, Rhode Island is home to the only offshore wind turbine farm uh, in the country. And uh, that was uh, constructed by the Rhode Island Bill and Trades Council. Under a project labor agreement. Under a project labor agreement. But that tra that, the training that goes into building one of those has got to be a lot different than the training that goes into building a hotel or a dormitory or a hospital mm -hmm. or something like that. So uh, how, do, how does the Bill and Trades gear up their workers for, for different projects with different skill levels and different skill sets? Well, depending on whatever complexity of, uh, of a project uh, is necessary, uh, we have the ability uh, in your own facility that you have out in East Providence, a state-of-the-art facility for plumbers and pipe fitters, a state-of-the-art facility out in Cranston for electricians, a state-of-the-art facilities uh, you know, for iron workers in East Providence, for laborers in Cranston as well as in Pomfret, Connecticut, and Hopkinton, Mass, and, and Rhode Island. You know, No matter what the craft is, we have the ability to train train to need, not only train our overall uh, knowledge that we need for whatever p particular uh, uh, classification we're talking about, but also at, if a unique project such as uh, offshore wind turbines come along, which isn't going to be that unique going forward because we just announced uh, uh, and we're having an announcement on Wednesday that we're going to uh, probably put 50 more out in the uh, in the state waters. Uh, that capacity will allow us to, to to train even more people specifically to the necessities of that particular project. And it is very high tech. These are very high paying jobs and uh, they're very unique uh, to uh, to um, turbines, uh, as well as like, for instance, when we have tunnel work, mm -hmm. where we have the ability then to focus and shift some of our manpower uh, to be specific to uh, working in a tunnel environment. So not only do we have our, our state-of-the-art 
you know, road that we go, but we have the ability to then even tweak those training programs to need a specific project, which is very unique mm -hmm. in any other, is unique to our industry as opposed to other industries. So let's talk about some of these projects. I mean, we've, we've talked there's going to be a need for, for, for people coming into, into the building trades. Uh, apprenticeships have to gear up. Uh, the diversity of the skill sets that are going to be needed. So um, what projects do we see moving forward? And, and how are these, these projects, uh, should they move forward, how is the diversity going to be uh, probably enhanced by the skill sets? Well, you know, we'll talk first of all about uh, the school, Fix Our School Coalition. You know, it's a, in a nutshell, we don't even have to go over it. Our schools are in terrible shape here. Um, they all need repair, renovation, or rebuilt. Um, there is a, a, a budget item at the State House right now. We've, uh, there is a coalition from labor, outside labor, and of course the building trades fighting for this. That will be a lot of potential work, and uh, of course along with that, we hope to bring in a newly diversified workforce, which we've been working at for years through a number of programs. One, Timmy, which you have at the Plumbers, our Building Futures program. Our doors are wide open, mm -hmm. and we're looking for a more diverse and younger workforce. No, we mentioned the project labor agreement on the offshore wind turbine. Every project that's constructed under a building trade project labor agreement has our Building Futures program embedded in that agreement that sets goals for 15% of the work hours for these projects to be performed by men and women that come through the Building Futures program, which concentrates on uh, the diversity of the building trades as well as uh, the urban population of disadvantaged communities to bring young men and women that want a career in the construction uh, industry via our registered apprenticeship programs, which is very unique. So Scott mentioned the schools, the other priorities that are uh, current right now are obviously we need a new Paw Sox Stadium. Uh, it's dragged on uh, long enough uh, to keep this uh, you know iconic franchise in, uh, in the state of Rhode Island and really rebuild downtown Pawtucket, which can be really exciting. Uh, we've got uh, legislation uh, 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 proposed to continue to pursue the Fane Tower. You know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, controversy on is it too tall, the, the way it looks and what have you. Does you it know. cast shadows? But, you know, it's, about it's, that. It's, it's a $300 million project in the middle mm -hmm. of, of the city of Providence, so we need some assistance with that. Uh, Scott had mentioned the schools, and we also have... Um, you know, other pressing needs as well in, uh, in other agencies, you know, clean water, sewer. Mm -hmm. You mentioned URI. We need to refocus uh, on the Bay Campus. We've got Rhode Island College that had need, has needs. So any of these projects, if they have an attachment of a, of a build and trade project labor agreement, both public and private, will negotiate in uh, the building future scenario to create opportunities for young men and women, continue to diversify the building trades, get us younger uh, also as well, and uh, bring people into our into into our industry via our registered apprenticeship programs, and that's how we're going to uh, proceed in the future. We talked a little bit about diversity. So how important is it that, that we, we try and diversify the, the look of our unions? Well, you know, we try to, you can't change history, and we've had issues in the past uh, in the building trades, not everyone and not every area, where we were a country club, and we only we did allow certain people to the front door across the country. That's changed, and particularly Rhode Island, where I'm on foremost leading that. Those days are done, and we're here to to take on anybody who's capable, and we're making an effort to reach into the un, underserved areas in Rhode Island. We think we're a great opportunity to make a career. Mm -hmm. So there is some bad history there, but I say let's confront that and move onward. And I say uh, it's quite evident that our, our efforts show that we've, you know, our current efforts and our current success rate is showing that we're turning all, we're turning our, our backs on that bad history. Well, a lot of people don't realize our industry is one of the few industries where there is no wage disparity. Mm -hmm. There is no gender wage disparity as well. The color of your skin, the, your gender makes no difference. If you can perform the function uh, of, a, of a tradesman or woman, depending on your classification, mm -hmm. you get the same exact pay and the same exact benefit structure. That's very unique that, that you don't see in a lot of other industries where you've got the, you know, the difference. Mm -hmm. A model to live by, actually, which, mm -hmm. which doesn't get lived by too much. 
So again, thanks for being with us, guys. Uh, we're going to have you back. There's so much to talk about, so much to, so much to, uh, to get out on the table to let people understand that the Rhode Island Building Trades Council is here. We've been here for 100 years. We're going to be here for another 100 years, and, and we build this state. So thank you again for joining us today on Labor Vision, and thanks, guys, for joining us. Thank, thank you for having me. us. We knew that we had to do training, training for organizers and our international reps in our local unions. And because of that training, we are making changes in the union. And no, we aren't losing membership. In fact, the BNA called us, I guess it was three weeks ago, and said, look, what is the deal? What's going on at the UFCW? What's going on is that we're listening to our members and we're trying to figure out how we can get better. What can we do to make them but what we're going to do in this, this coming year, because, you know, not for nothing, I just got elected again. <laughs> is that we need to understand the fastest growing workforce in America today, and that's the millennials. So we're going to start a research project just on millennials. We're going to try to determine what's going to be useful in talking to millennials about organizing because they're going to dominate our workforce very soon. We're trying to analyze the impact of automation. Uh, I'm ultimately heading up the AFL-CO's uh, sector division uh, for the future work now and we're having conversations about how automation and AI may ultimately affect us going forward in the future. And I want to throw a few statistics at you. The Obama administration in December of 2016 projected by 2035 that we could have unemployment levels as high as 47%. Now, in the Great Depression, at the height of the Great Depression, when unemployment was at its highest level, it was 24.9%. And the size of the population then, that meant there were 15 million people. And so if you think of the population today, let's say it's 280 million, 300 million, we're looking at 100 and 50 million people unemployed in this country, labor and management needs to figure out something. Because if there's that many people unemployed, who's going to buy the stuff they make? Who's going to pay the taxes that support the infrastructure? What is going to happen? What's our political system going to look like? We saw what happened in Germany. We just saw what happened in our past election. Strange things happen when people are dissatisfied. And who knows what sort of political system we could end up with if that does take place. So regardless of what we face or will face, we're determined to control our own destiny going forward. In doing so, that ultimately means that we have to accept the fact that positive change is never going to happen by itself. And as difficult as it may be to hear, there are no saviors coming. If we want to save this country from the state that it's in, we must save it. If we want to lift families up, we must lift them. None of this is going to happen by accident or by luck. Words will not be enough. We must act, but we must act boldly. We must embrace our responsibility to lead. We must be proud of our values and rethink how we reach workers who share our values because, to be blunt, it's about time that hard work is valued in America again.
no society, no just society at least, was ever built on a foundation of inequality. We all know this. So as I end, let me respectfully ask one thing of each and every one of you. Challenge yourselves and your union and your institutions to get better. Ask yourselves what your union, what your organization can do to get better. Put aside all the insane distractions that we have from the White House or in politics. Focus on our collective power to shape the America that we believe in and that we could ultimately be proud of. And let's never forget this. We are our brothers and our sisters keeper. We have the power to change this country, to give hope, to inspire and lead change. And no matter the obstacle that we face, no matter how hard it is, we must believe in ourselves and each other, in our strength and our values and our responsibility, and never, and I mean never, allow any obstacle, no matter what it is, to distract us from the mission to build a more decent, fair, and just and equal America for this and the next generation. We can do this, and together we will. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I want to thank the ILSR. Congratulations to you, Tim, and all the other honorees. Now let's go build a better America that our children and our families deserve. Thank you, everyone. The Leadership for a Future program began in 2000 to help develop the leadership skills of new and longtime labor and community members by exposing them to a volunteer faculty willing to share their knowledge and experience in an effort to make Rhode Island a more just and equitable society. Some of this year's instructors are here with us tonight. I want to thank uh, Scott Malloy from URI. Pat Pat Crowley, Larry Pirtle, and Ray Sullivan from the NEA. <laughs> Haney Maldonado from Fuerza Laboral again. <laughs> Doug Hall from the Economic Progress Institute. <laughs> Keith Stokes from the May Mayforth Group. Dr. Colleen Callahan and Jim Parisi from the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals. And a special thank you to George Nee from the Rhode Island AFL-CIO, so thank you. The real value of this program, however, is not just its faculty, it's our participants. I'm sad to say that I wasn't able to speak with as many of you over the course of these last 10 weeks as I would have liked. But earlier this week, I did have a chance to watch each of you, as each of you stood before your fellow classmates, your friends, and your family to share your stories of self, us, and now. To share his story, I'd like to present Ryan DeJesus, whose Community Action Project was on the Open Minds Alliance, an organization he actually helped to found earlier this year. Ryan showed up early for class every week with a smile and a genuine interest to learn and grow and to eat a little bit earlier than we were all supposed to be. That's fine. <laughs> he approached his classmates with an open mind and friendly, engaging conversation. As a small business owner and vice president of the United Steelworkers Local 4543, he is the epitome of who the Leadership for a Future program was designed to serve. Without further ado, Ryan. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> I'm your guest speaker, Ryan the Jesus. I'm a founding father of Open Minds Alliance, vice president of the Steelworkers Union, local 4543, and a highly respected member of the Bray Ridge Club. I'm also an avid karaoke singer. Now, I could talk about all four of those things that I mentioned above, but tonight's not about any of that. Tonight's about us. It's about Rhode Island. It's about mothers, fathers, brothers, and sisters, all who will be future leaders in this great state. I stand here before you honored and humbled, selected amongst my peers to be the valid Victorian of the class. I'm still not quite sure what that means, but it entitles me to a speech, so nonetheless, here I am. But enough with the funnies. I'd like to start off by acknowledging and thanking Jim Riley, Desiree LeClaire, and our facilitator, Andrea Gomez for her desire, dedication, and distinct ability to mesh all these personalities 
into one beautifully synchronized song. I'd also like to thank George Nee of the Rhode Island AFL-CIO and all the other organized labor organizations in attendance here tonight for supporting the Institute and making sure that we could participate in such an enriching program such as Leadership for a Future. I want to give my gratitude to our guest speakers, Mike Van Leesten, Jim Vincent, James Parisi, Mike Arujo, Pat Crowley, Ray Sullivan, Colleen Callahan, Lawrence Perdo, Scott Jensen, Keith Stokes, Tom Coderre, and respectively, Senate Majority Leader Mike McCaffrey and Speaker of the House Nicholas Mattiello for so graciously representing Rhode Island and taking the time to spend this moment with us. I'd also like to thank Andrew Arsenault and Lisa Nelson for coming by and sharing their stories with us. Your examples were vital to our personal success. Lastly, I have the privilege to thank the Leadership for a Future Class of 2018, Silas, Silvana, Jamie, John, both Victorias, Valentina, Kunal, Paul, Paula, Jeremy, Lee, Willie, Erica, and Tony. The everlasting impact you have made on my intentions are insurmountable. This class introduced me to so many amazing individuals who I would not have crossed paths with thus eliminating the opportunity to sit down, brainstorm, and put together all the good ideas of work that we will be doing in the future. LFAF gives me hope for a future. By training people to be organizers, we only build a stronger democracy. I believe I speak for all of us when I say that this program has gave us the tools to grow into the person that we envision ourselves becoming. We learn how to foster relationships, how to be sensitive to each other's diversity, how to engage and organize in the community and take corrective measures to address those problems. We were taught about how oppression manifests on four levels, institutional, interpersonal, ideological, and internal. And then we were taught the skills to combat it. We were also left with a cornucopia of quotes, and two of my personal favorites were claim no easy victories and claim no false wins. And the other was peaceably if we may and forcibly if we must. <laughs> These past 10 weeks have been extraordinary from wanting to leave the retreat day one because I don't like sleeping with strangers, <laughs> to not wanting to leave the program at all, and the people who make it so special. Before I go, I want to give one last thank you to Bob Delaney. And Bob had a great quote I'd like to share it with you all. Change is needed more than ever in history, and leaders are required to make these changes. But leaders must also learn to follow. So following up my last statement for the night, I'd like to say that I may be the speaker, but this is our speech, and this is our award ceremony. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, get on your feet and give it up for the class, Leadership for a Future Class of 2018. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week. Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.